Hi, I'm Matt Williams. Welcome to Glimpses. My guest today is an award-winning playwright and screenwriter. He has won three Obie Awards, a Tony Award, a Drama Desk Award, and has been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize multiple times. Hilton Ailes of the New Yorker magazine has described this man as the most successful Chinese-American playwright this country has produced. He is a good friend, a remarkable talent, and I am thrilled to have David Henry Wong as my guest on Glimpses. I've known you for years. Yeah. But in preparing for this podcast, I started Googling and looking at all your... My gosh, you're a busy man. Oh, yeah. And hopefully you didn't find anything untoward about me on the web. It just said, oh. great great guy, works hard, really talented. That's okay. the only thing. Okay. You, if you type in great guy, really talented, they, it comes up with your name. Oh, thank you. How old were you when you wanted to tell stories? When did you start telling stories? I mean, I didn't really start thinking about um, writing scripts until um, college, until I was an undergraduate. Uh, before that, I was a musician. Uh, if anything, I was also a debater, which was like super geeky, uh, but that's what I did <laughs> in high school, and that's how I ended up getting from my public school to a private school. But anyway, and then prior, I'd been a violinist, uh, but then started to improvise. I, I became a jazz violinist in uh, college. So that was mostly what I was doing. But then around sophomore year, um, because I had played in pit orchestras for high school musicals, and I liked kind of hanging out afterwards and listening to the director give notes, um, the idea came into my head, you know, I should try writing plays. And um, I went to Stanford, and at the time there was, uh, they didn't have any playwriting classes. Okay. But I found a professor who was willing to take a look at my plays, which I was writing my spare time. And he told me they were really bad, which they were, and that my problem was that I wanted to write plays, but I didn't actually know anything about the theater. But the same professor uh, was a good guy. He helped me um, create a, a playwriting major within the creative writing department, Incredible. and that became my education. Wow. Now, your mother, though, was a professor of piano, right? Yes. And my mom was a pianist. My so, sister's a cellist. I come from So a, you were around music, and, and that was all part of your... I, I didn't realize you were a jazz violinist. Yeah. So you're the Stefan Grappelli of playwrights? Uh, Grappelli, yes. Um, <laughs> as playwrights go, I would be the Grappelli or the Jean Fonti or one of those. Well, I started looking, uh, again, I, I've known you for so long, and, and, but I learned so much. And all these influences in the arc of your career, at that early on, you studied with Sam Shepard. Yeah. What did Sam teach you? So um, the summer between my junior and senior year, I saw an ad in the LA Times, I'm from LA, that said, uh, study playwriting with Sam Shepard. And I clipped this thing and sent it in because I was a big, big fan of Sam's. Um, and it was the first year of what eventually became a pretty prominent event in Southern California theater, which was called the Padua Hills Playwrights Festival. Mm -hmm. This was only the first year that they ever tried to do it. So there are only two of us that applied to be students. So we both got in. And it was Sam, it was um, Maria Irene Fernandez, who I think is arguably the great playwriting teacher of her generation. Um, Murray Mednick, Walter Hadler, and essentially they taught us uh, to, well, there were only two of us, so we all just kind of participated in their exercises to write more from the subconscious. Um, so anything that was more um, deliberate or more crafted or more structured was not cool with these, this group, and it was really kind of learning to follow your impulses. And that taught me to create plays and have characters come to life um, at, at, because you don't, you know, as David Burns said, you know, stop making sense. I wasn't trying to make sense anymore. I was just trying to follow what the characters seemed to be doing in my head. That's great. That's great. You and I, I remember one day at Columbia, we were talking and we both kind of agreed that plays are written from somewhere back here, yep. right? Somewhere in the deep unconscious. It, and you don't even know what it is sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you have to get it out. Because if, if it's too neat and perfect coming out, it's usually not right. Yeah, it, it, it lacks a certain amount of life and discovery that a play seems to need to have. Discovery, that's the operative word. And there's that adage, you know, no discovery for the writer, no discovery for the reader. And I think that's true with playwriting as well. 
Yeah, I, I find it, I mean, obviously I structure things when I work in other forms, but right. when I write a play, um, I'm like the audience when I'm doing the first draft. So I'm finding out things about the characters and I'm finding out the story as I'm writing uh, along. Okay, now I, I, I wanna go from Sam Shepard to the legendary Joseph Papp at The Public was your champion early on and he produced a lot of your early plays, FOB, The Dance in the Railroad, Family Devotions. What did you learn from Joseph Papp? Well, I mean, well, there's so much to learn from Joe, and Joe was a brilliant, obviously, but also complicated guy. Um, and, you know, I got the opportunity, so I wrote this play to be done in my dorm called FOB. Uh -huh. And 14 months later, it Could got, I jump in? Yes. FOB is fresh off fresh the boat. Fresh off the boat. Oh, right. Um, which now there's a television series <laughs> yeah, called Fresh, called fresh off, off the Boat. But, um, so. 14 months later, it opened at the Public Theater and, and uh, produced by Joe, who was the founder and, and still uh, running it at that point. Um, and the way that happened largely was this sort of confluence of um, art and community activism because um, the public had produced a sh show um, in which a white actor was cast in an Asian role. And this led to the first yellow face protests in New York theater history, where the Asian actors of that day, who were few in number and had no power, um, protested outside the public theater. And Joe, who was a lefty and you know uh, committed communist <laughs> and uh, wanted to create a theater who looked like that looked like New York, right. Joe invited them into his office and he hired one of them onto his staff with the assignment to find plays for Asian actors. And it was just about that time that my FOB came across their desk. So I was re I'm really the beneficiary of affirmative action because that's what affirmative action does. It identifies a social need and then creates a program to try to redress that. And Joe uh, basically did that all on his own. I tell my students, luck is when preparation meets opportunity and you were prepared. You had done your hours of writing and writing your bad scripts as yeah. we all do mm -hmm. and get through those. So when you finally wrote that good script and that opportunity came along, that was your lucky break. Yeah, um, okay. I, I was very fortunate to get out of the starting gate early, but you're right that, you know, I, you, I also think I'm a good writer. So. You are a good writer. And you also worked with Philip Glass on several projects. So in my brain, I'm going, how do you go from Sam Shepard to Philip Glass? How do you do that? Um, I mean, Philip, you know, lives in the East Village. He's um, very associated with the public theater. He saw some of my early plays at the public and kind of made it a point to approach me to collaborate on something. And it's a lesson that I've learned as I've gotten old um, that, you know, even when I was hitting middle age, I thought, oh, it's really smart, actually, to collaborate with people who are younger because they bring a different energy, they bring right. a different aesthetic, a different degree of hunger. And I think Philip, you know, is maybe 20 or 30 years older than I am. Uh -huh. So when I was 28 or 29 and he approached me, um, you know, I was, I was definitely the uh, younger generation. And you brought that energy. So let's talk, <clears throat> I, I, some people don't like to talk about pro process, but you've already kind of begun that. Yeah, I like talking about Because process. I go, how do you begin? And now you, you, you talked about your plays from the deep unconscious instead of trying to make it neat. But here's where I am truly in awe of your talent because you write the librettos for operas. You write the books for musicals. You write screenplays. You write teleplays. You write plays. How do you go from one to the other? Is there a switch in your brain or is it just basic dramaturgy each time out? I mean, I think they are different forms and they right. overlap. You know, they're sort of like Venn diagrams of, um, and for, I believe it took me a long time to figure out how to be um, a good screenwriter. Um, and what really um, flipped a switch for me was just in the past 10 years, um, working on the TV show, The Affair, for four years. And at, you know, we produced our own episodes on that show. So I was on set, um, I was sometimes part of editing, right. and I really understood how these things start to get put together. And that taught me a lot about the form. Um, other than that, I feel like the question is, okay, who's, the, who's in charge? Who, mm -hmm. who is the decider? And if it's a play, it's me. If it's a TV show, it's the showrunner. If it's a 
film, I would say it's the director. Right. Opera, I, I believe the composer. And then musicals are weird. Musicals don't necessarily have one person in charge. And I think that's what's make, what makes them a really difficult form. The three or four people, the you know, book writer, co uh, composer, lyricist, director, maybe the producer, um, have to do kind of a mind meld and become one voice together. And um, that's a particular challenge. Well, let's talk about that because you wrote the book for Aida, Flower Drum Song, Tarzan. So if you had to give advice to a young writer going, if you've gone from being a playwright to writing the book for a musical, what, what's the first piece of advice? I mean, I do believe that books of musicals need to be structured, um, as a, which is sort of the opposite of what we were talking about just right. a moment ago, because you have to have so many people on board um, and uh, adhering to the same vision. And I think the book writer, like my job is to go first. So... I need to throw something out um, that, you know, basically an outline, uh, and then everybody else can jump in and tear it apart, and it's not going to be, you know, probably close right. to what it is I started out with, but somebody has to go first. Right, right. And also, I'm sure you found this in TV, it's so collaborative. You have to be collaborative. You can't, a playwright you know, we, we tease, you change a comma and a playwright goes into a hissy fit. On TV, you're, re, you're rewriting up even onto the set. When yeah. you're on the set, you're constantly collaborating and adjusting with the writers and the director, and, and it is truly a collaborative process. Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons, um, like, oftentimes TV writers have proven to be really good musical book writers because they have that flexibility, they right. have that craft, and uh, they're not precious with their work. Right, right. Okay, well, let's talk about uh, M. Butterfly. It, it premiered on Broadway in 88, huge success, won all these awards. And then there was a revival in 2017. Clive Owen played the lead. I saw it. It was brilliant production. Julie Tamar directed it. Did you make changes to the play? For that, that was almost 20 years later. So was it weird going back at something that had been received so well and then to go back into the script with the director and, and, and this actor? Yeah, it, it was an interesting experience. I mean, I believe in rewriting and I guess <laughs> I mean, you know, there's playwrights will break it down. Like you'll see about half of playwrights I would that I've heard answer this question are willing to go back to their old work and rewrite it. And then there's a bunch of people who say, I'm not going to touch that. Right. It was done. And um, Doug Wright, I, I asked once uh, that's a question, and he said, well, I don't trust the Doug of 2016 to rewrite the Doug of 2008, which I think is a perfectly legitimate point of view. I don't happen to agree with it. Um, Kushner says that he's an inveterate, inveterate rewriter, so, you know, it, it varies. Okay. But I really, uh, I didn't know what it, was, what it was going to feel like, but um, I enjoyed revisiting the characters. It was sort of like coming back to old friends. And I felt particularly in the case of M. Butterfly because it was, um, it, it, it kind of hit the zeitgeist of the times um, and dealt with some issues that hadn't really been addressed on Broadway. But um, the times had changed and things had moved on. And particularly where it, I mean, M. Butterfly is, um, about a, a French diplomat who had a 20-year affair with a Chinese actress who turned out to be A, a spy, and B, male. And so the way we think about gender has changed so much right. in the last 20 or 30 years, not to mention the U.S.-China relationship. So um, we wanted to address some of those um, issues as we were going into the revival. And the revival didn't run as long, but I actually think it's a better script. Okay, good, good. So you didn't take a step back. I don't, I don't think so. I want to talk about Chinglish because I saw it on Broadway and laughed. Uh, it's a very funny play. I think of you as a serious dramatist, but that's a very funny play. Would you describe for the listeners how that came about? And, and the play's called Chinglish. It's, uh, I will tell you, I laugh very hard. Well, thank you. <laughs> when I watched it. So Chinglish sort of takes as its jumping off point these signs that you would see um, you know, as memes or on the web. Um, maybe like 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, of um, badly translated uh, English signs in China. Okay. And it seemed, you know, like a slip and fall down carefully. Um, <laughs> and it seemed to me to be sort of an interesting jumping off point for examining 
kind of U.S.-China relations and the way in which language and misunderstandings of, in language serve as sort of a metaphor for larger cultural and international uh, misunderstandings. So, um, so I wanted to write a bilingual play. I'm not bilingual, so you know potentially that is a problem. But um, I collaborated with a Hong Kong-based playwright who was a friend who became the translator. Okay. Um, and and we made the show about um, an American, you know, white American businessman from the Midwest who goes to China, who's trying to get a contract to um, translate the signs, um, and uh, falls into a, 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 there's a complicated romance. Um, and the, and then I was trying to figure out, okay, how do we do, if we're going to do a bilingual play, how does the audience understand it? Yeah. And because I'd worked in opera and I was used to having um, supertitles projected, I thought, okay, we can basically subtitle it like a movie or TV show, um, which is pretty, which is much more common now, but wasn't done so much in 2012. Um, and I didn't actually know it was going to be as funny as it was. I was really just trying to follow the story. And I thought, you know, some of this stuff is going to be amusing. Uh, and then the first time we read it, like even on with the translation that's on a laptop at um, the former Lark Play Development Center, um, and it turned out to be, oh, I realized I'd written a farce, and I didn't, I didn't know that. that. Well, it was very funny, and I think the subtitles made it funnier mm -hmm. <clears throat> because you're watching, you're reading, and you realize the miscommunication that's occurring on stage. And so I guess as an audience member, I didn't realize it till just a second. We got to participate in the processing of the language the same as the characters. Exactly, I mean, so farce is, you know, when the audience knows more than the characters do. So right. the mistress is hiding in the closet and we know it, but the characters don't know. There's somebody who's trying to hide that. Right. And similarly, with the subtitles, as you point out, created this kind of inadvertent, like, uh, unintentional, really, right. farcical situation where we know everything that everybody's saying, but not everybody on stage knows what the other people are saying. That's, that's great. Uh, so I, I want to talk about one of the themes, uh, knowing your plays and knowing you. One of the themes is identity, mm -hmm. how we identify, how others identify us. There's always this image in your plays of peeling away the mask, the persona, right? Yeah and dealing with the truth, who am I, how do I fit in? Are you still wrestling with those issues? Is that still a primary issue when you go to write? Or have you, uh, are you addressing other issues now? I mean, I, I think that uh, the issue of identity has evolved for me as it's evolved for, you know, other AAI, AAPI people, as it's, involved, as it's evolved for the country. Mm -hmm. um, and fundamentally, though, I, I think this question of identity is not limited, really, to people of color or whatever. It's, you know, the question, who am I? Right. It's a pretty central um, query of all literature. And so um, I think I continue to address that even when I'm not doing so explicitly. Okay, okay. And uh, do you identify, you, you know, Hilton Ailes calls you the most successful Chinese-American playwright. Is that how you identify? Do you think of yourself as an American writer, a Chinese-American writer? Do you think of yourself as a, uh, a book writer? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I don't, I don't feel the need to pick one of those. Great. And I don't think they're necessarily at odds. I mean, again, if you bring up this sort of question of book writer versus um, TV writer, versus, I'm, I'm all those things. And similarly, where it comes to my... Um, my personal identity and my background, I'm a bunch of different things too. Right, right, okay. Do you feel, you know, some in, in classrooms, they sometimes talk about the responsibility of the writer. Do you feel a certain responsibility? I, I, you mean where, like to my particular community? To like or to your community, community or, or to just telling the truth about what it is to be a human being at this particular moment in time? I mean, I you do know? feel a responsibility to write the best script that I can and to be as truthful as I can, even when, you know, there, there are plays of mine like Yellowface where a part of the conceit of the play is that there is stuff that's made up mixed with the stuff that's truthful. Right. Um, and for me, that gets at a certain reality and, and a point that I'm trying to make. But 
um, yeah, the, the responsibility is to be um, as truthful as I can to what it is that I'm trying to explore in that play. And I usually, you know, do start with some sort of question, like there's some, something that I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with and I don't know the answer and I write the play to find out how I feel about it more deeply. Um, you know, there have, I've been fortunate to have a long career and I was uh, a prominent um, Asian American playwright before there were a lot of them. So there have been periods that I've gone through where I felt like, okay, is it my responsibility to tell the story for, you know, my entire community? Okay. And what I came to realize is, okay, that's not really possible. The expectation gets put on you when there aren't too many people who look like you who become prominent in a particular field. But it's not possible to speak for all people in my community because none of these communities are monolithic. And there's just a wide range of opinions, experiences, and activities that, uh, that any of these labels encompass. Okay. Well, you've had this amazing career, <clears throat> constantly working. You also have a beautiful family, two great kids, wonderful wife. How do you balance that? Because I've found, I, I saw a master class with Joyce Carol Oates, mm -hmm. and she said something that was so profound. She said, your biggest enemy will be the person stealing your time. And it's not going to be someone who's mean or coming in to interrupt you. It's the people you love the most. Mm. And while you're, and I know you write in the morning, right? and I, as do I. And, and when people come and go, do you have a moment? Could I just, put, and you, poof, the little bubble pops and you go, you can't interrupt me. How, how, how do you get your writing time? I know your kids are grown now, but how do you get your writing time in while dealing with a wife and children and a dog and house? <laughs> I mean, I think that, that uh, I'm happy to say that our kids were always pretty respectful of the, okay, dad's door is closed in the morning and uh, you know, don't bug him then. And it may be also because I, I'm i not one of these people who writes all day. And, you know, you say you write in the mornings. And, uh, you know, how many hours can you write a day? So I'm done usually by one or two. Right. Which, yes, and then there's, you know, emails and meetings and stuff like that. But that is, I don't know, if I, you probably feel the same way. That's not really working. Uh -huh. The actual working <laughs> is putting the stuff on the pad or on the computer, whatever. Everything else like feels pretty easy. And then if someone interrupts that, I don't really care. Uh, amen to that. I'm the same way. Emails interrupt me as much. But when you are in that, I call it the little bubble of imagination or that the ether of imagination, and somebody just wants your attention for a few minutes, it kind of pops. And then it takes you 20 minutes to get back to where you were. Yeah. You know? So I, I, yes, I think I've been really fortunate in that regard. Okay. I want to ask you about uh, the Cherry Lane Mentor Series. Mm -hmm. My wife started the series. Yeah. Angelina Fiordalisi started the Mentor Series years ago. And you have always been so gracious with your time yeah, and so you. generous with the writers. And you mentored uh, a number of writers. What was the primary advice you gave these writers? Um. So first of all, I, I just want to say I did it because uh, the Terry Lane Mentor Program was an extraordinary idea um, that Angelina uh, promulgated and supported uh, for so many years, um, and that young writers, emerging writers, could get a production on the Terry Lane stage, um, a sort of major New York production. That's stunning. Um, so I wanted to be part of that, and I think that it's, you know, playwriting is one of those professions that really hasn't changed that much in the past, you know, centuries. Right. Um, yes, the, you know, there's technical things that are, are fancier, but basically the, writing the play, a play is the same way writing a play was in the 15th century, and so I, I think of playwrights as like, you know, cobblers, like people make shoes. Like you, it's part of your job at a certain point to try to um, pass your knowledge down to the next generation. And I, I do it in a more formal sense now at Columbia. But going back to uh, Cherry Lane, it was an opportunity to start to start to do that. Um, and yes, I have like general advice about career and, you know, you should, I think it's useful to know how to do a lot of things because your playwriting is really not going to support you financially. Um, but it's also just about trying to be the best um, dramaturg I can for the script that is getting produced and tr trying to give advice and 
suggest things and understand, first of all, understand what it is the playwright's trying to do, right. and then try to uh, pitch some things that might uh, make it happen better. And then I think mentoring also involves taking people out for meals and drinks. So mentoring involves taking writers out for a meal or a drink. I found, I've watched you mentor, I've watched my wife, I've watched Sam Shepard and others at the Cherry Lane Mentor, and I've found the people who mentor really well just know how to ask the right questions, as opposed to, this is how you should write your play. You're not telling someone how to write your play, correct? correct. I've watched you, in, in, when you're talking to a playwright, you'll just start asking, well, what are you really intending here? What are you trying to say? Is that correct? Yes. Would you say? Yeah, because it's not, <laughs> um, you know... We're, we're not trying to do a, a, a be Sid Field, and um, there's a particular structure that you have to have for a play. Um, it's, it's the opposite, as we were talking about earlier, a play is sort of something comes out of your lizard brain. Um, so um, I think, I mean this to sound positive, I think that um, teaching playwriting is a little bit like being a therapist, because, you know, a good therapist doesn't tell the patient, oh, you should do this and this and this. Right. A good therapist tries to understand what it is that the, the patient wants and then, you know, helps, hopefully helps the patient to come up with their own ways of approaching their issues. Well, when you're teaching at Columbia, as do I, and you've got, oh, 10 students in the room, and each one's different, mm -hmm. and they're usually culturally from different parts of the world. Uh, some, sometimes the age varies. How do, how do you guide 10 students around the table? Do you keep asking the same question, like, you know, what's your intent? What's, what is the premise of your play? Or do you just read the subtleties of that personality and keep adjusting to them? Yeah, I think it's individual. I okay. think it comes down to the particular student. And, and you know, because um, I'm no longer running, as you know, I'm no longer running the playwriting program, but when I was um, doing admissions, I kind of purposely wanted to have a wide range of aesthetics, of um, ages, of uh, people from different communities and, and international students and ethnicities, because I think it, it creates a healthier environment. If you're gonna have like eight to 10 students in a cohort, it's somewhat helpful that they're not all trying to do the same thing yes. and they can support each other and go, well, that's the play that you would write, but you know, I, I, I wouldn't write that play, but I can appreciate what it is you do. And, you know, at, at Columbia between, you know, you and me and Chuck, me and Lynn Nottage, I mean, we're all different, but we right. all respect each other's work. And that's the joy of teaching because the, uh, you know, the variety of personalities and cultures in that room and because I teach a comedy class, it's very interesting mm -hmm. because you, you get to see what translates as funny, whether you're Chinese or you're from Nigeria or, or Guatemala or Mexico City, as I've had in the past. And how do they perceive humor? How do they perceive comedy? And that's, that, that's eye-opening to me. It's always fun. Yeah, that's, I, I would actually like to learn more about that, so may I sit in on your thing? Yeah, it's, it's fun because, and I found uh, last, the last semester I taught, three of the funniest students were all Chinese, and they all dealt with the spiritual realm and ghosts and ancestors, and it was hilarious. And they were all funny in different ways, but the cultural cultural uh foundation was there mm -hmm. and they were they wrote three entirely different scripts but they were all hilarious oh, that's very amazing. funny yeah yeah so speaking of spiritual uh glimpses is a book that i've written it's a collection of essays humorous and what i call spiritual musings the intent behind the book is to encourage readers to look for and find little glimpses of god in their daily life and by the god i'm talking about tenderness compassion unexpected kindness do you have glimpses in your life? Do you see it in and around the city, in the classroom? I, I, I think I do. I mean, I, I, one thing that I'm focused on, or I find myself um, popping into my head fairly, like maybe on a daily basis, is just a sense of wonder and a sense of awe um, and being able to go, you know, whatever, I'll be in Times Square and it'll be really crowded and, you know, bumping into people. And, I'll, and it'll just feel to me amazing to have all these people 
from different places in this, in, in the, you know, on this sidewalk, um, and also that I've taken a path where I, I, this is how I've decided to spend my life. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't make it, a, a, I mean, I like my choices, but it doesn't necessarily make it a good choice or bad choice, just to sort of be aware of the larger whole. And I think that maybe that is kind of a form of spirituality or God. Well, I do think every artist, true artist, possesses a certain amount of um, wonder and awe. Mm -hmm. Because just you are alive on this little grain of sand, spinning in an expanding universe where there's trillions of galaxies, and here you are alive in Times Square, and inside all this, this amazing universe, and there is a degree of awe in that. And I think as an artist, you look around and go, well, how do I capture that? How do I mm. embody that in characters? How do I put that on the screen or stage, yeah. right? Yes, and you know, uh, sort of on the, on the flip side of that, I remember, like there was, you know, all our careers, we go, they go up and down, um, and I was having sort of a bad career year, and I remember being in Hong Kong. I can't remember why I was there. Um, and I was walking along the bay in Kowloon. And I, I said to some, some god, um, just whatever happens, don't let me become bitter. Oh. And, so, you know, so it wasn't about make my career better. It was just about, like, my point of view. And I think it, it's an attempt to... Um, to, to hang on to that sense of wonder and awe that you talk about, because bitterness, I think, is, it can corrode that. So, David, we're talking about this spiritual aspect and having a sense of wonder and awe, and yet you were walking home one night, and you were the victim of a hate crime. Mm. Could you explain what happened? Yeah, so I was, um, it was Thanksgiving, uh, we just, uh, my wife's from Rockford, Illinois, so we usually go there because Midwesterners are like really into their Thanksgivings. Um, and uh, it was Sunday night, we'd come back, um, got, uh, and I was going out for groceries. It was about 9 p.m. Um, I uh, had the groceries, I was on my block, and I felt like somebody um, like hit me on the back of my head. And I was like, what the fuck? Um, and I turned and I saw someone sort of running uh, off. And I figured, okay, I'm not going to chase them down. So I guess I'll just keep walking home. But then I found I couldn't walk straight and I veered into a, a, a car and then into a wall. And I put my hand up to where I'd been hit and it came away covered with blood. Um, and I had been a boy scout. Uh, <laughs> So I remembered that, oh, you're supposed to put pressure on a wound. So I put pressure on the wound, and then I found I could walk straight. Um, oh and I got, um, I, 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 fortunately, we live like two blocks from Brooklyn Hospital uh, in Fort Greene. And so um, I passed by my house. I dropped off the groceries. Uh, and I said, um, my wife and daughter were home, and I said, oh, um, I could use some help. I think I've been attacked. But then I also thought, you know, I should just keep going and get to the hospital. So I went back down the stoop. They caught up with me. And you're walking and putting walking, pressure. Yeah, this whole I'm walking time. just trying to, you know, keep from bleeding out. Um, oh and um, they, we got to the hospital um, and walked in. Uh, the, you know, the, my wife said, um, my, my husband's been stabbed. And so they walked me into the ER. And then I said, I think I'm going to faint now. And then I did, and I guess I went into convulsions after that. Um, but it turned out that I had, uh, the attacker had severed my vertebral artery, um, and I, lo I lost about a third of my blood uh, before, you know, before they stabilized me. Um, but, you know, one of the things that was, um, it's hard to say uplifting, but sort of reassuring about that was at, when I said I'm, I'm going to faint, and I started to pass out. I remember thinking, oh, this is how you die. Um, it's just like you go to sleep. And it was sort of comforting. Like, it didn't really bug me that much. Um, and then fortunately... So you had this calm as you yeah, were... Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it's great that I didn't die. And I, you know, was out of the hospital in a couple days. And, I mean, we don't know it was a hate attack, but... Um, we have an assemblyman 
uh, here in New York, Ron Kim, who represents Queens. And um, Ron called a press conference uh, because there had been other um, attacks on um, Asian Americans. This is sort of prior to the, you know, the big spike in the pandemic of, right. of, of anti-Asian hate crimes. Um, there had been uh, some attacks on, on Chinese Americans around then. Um, so Ron Kim called a press conference to denounce anti-Asian hate. And I was sort of a, this is a terrible thing to say, but I was sort of like an OG AAPI, you know, hate attack uh, survivor. Uh, thank goodness you didn't die. Yes. And you're here to keep writing and inspiring audiences and delighting them. Thank you. And um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. That was so much fun. It, it is fun, and uh, I, I, I truly am in awe of your talent. <laughs> well, thank I, you. I truly am. And for those of you listening, thank you for joining us on Glimpses. Uh, as you go about your day, uh, take the time to look around and catch a glimpse. My friends, thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Glimpses. Speaking of, we're merely weeks away from the release of my latest book. And the best part? All of the proceeds will be going to charities who support children in need. You can get your copy in the link below. Until next time, have an amazing day.